Okay, uh, this week um, we are looking at what's called the ecology school. Okay, we're looking at ecological approaches to understanding crime. This also is a form of sociological positivism. So for the last two weeks we've looked at forms of sociological positivism and we're continuing that trend today. So we're looking at what's called the ecological school, or it's sometimes referred to, or more commonly referred to as the ecological Sometimes referred to as the Chicago School. Okay, and this is an ecological approach to understanding bias. Ecology basically means the relationship um, between living species and the environment. Okay, so just to give you uh, an indication of where this lecture is going, okay, just to give you an idea of kind of what I'm going to outline to you today is that what we're going to be looking at is this. We're going to be looking and exploring what's called the spatial distribution of crime. The spatial distribution of crime. What does that mean? Well, what that means is, is that when we look at the incidence of crime, when we look at where crime occurs, it appears as though crime clusters in certain areas. So in the popular imagination, certainly crime is associated with the urban environment, with the urban environment, okay? So why is that then? Why does crime seem to be associated with the urban environment? Okay, that's what we're going to explore today. So we're going to be looking at the spatial distribution. Now, I think um, in your first year, you would have looked at what's called the broken windows hypothesis. Is that right? Does this mean anything to you? Some of you not in good right now. Okay, well, we're going to be drawing from some of those notions, but the broken windows hypothesis really comes, in many ways, its foundations as to be found here in the Chicago School. Okay? Now, before we go on to look at the Chicago School in any great detail, there's one thing that we must do first, which is... Speak up. Context. Who said that? Yeah, thank you. Right, context. Right, we need to explore context. Why do we do that? To understand the theory, understand the context, the context will always inform the theory. Theory is always driven and situated by context, right? Okay, so, um, Chicago School. Let me give you um, the period, the time frame that we're looking at. 1920s America. Very similar time um, to the period <coughs> in which R.K. Merton was writing. Do you remember last week when we looked at R.K. Merton? We noticed a few things. Let's try, try and draw some connections. What is it that, that, that um, R.K. Merton and Durkheim shared? They, used, they both employed a similar concept, didn't they? What was the concept that they both employed? Anyone remember from last week or the week before? Merton developed one of Durkheim's concepts. What was it? Anomie. Anomie, right, excellent. Right, so Durkheim developed this concept called anomie, okay? um, a situation of normlessness. And R.K. Merton takes that concept and he uses it in, in a less um, abstract way. He says that anomie would affect different groups in different ways. And he said there are adaptations, you remember through the five different adaptations to, um, to anomie, to what would happen if there's a situation of normlessness. And one of them he called um, innovation, which is what he meant by crime. Now, the one thing that Durkheim and Merton had in common, that these guys also had in common, is that they are sociological positivists, okay? Now, what does sociological positivism seek to do? And let's go back even further, then. let's go back three weeks. What is it that sociological positivism seeks to show? What's its, what's its driving force? What's the main thrust of what it seeks to do? The things such as like economic recession and um, just social things are causes for Economic life. recession and social things Okay, what you're talking about then are that in order to understand um, things like crime, we must understand social facts as though they are things. So we look at external forces, forces external to the individual that may have an impact. Okay, so with R.K. Merton, um, R.K. Merton said that if there's a disjuncture between means and ends, these external factors outside of the individual, then 
um, this will have an impact upon um, group behaviour, will have an impact upon um, uh, the types of crime, for example, levels of crime. So we're looking at external forces then, the way external forces will impact. So, well, let's just take these two words then. Right? So we've got the Chicago School, so we're talking 1920s America. And we're already familiar with some of the key drivers in terms of context from last week. We said that there was um, a huge depression, didn't we? An economic depression. We said that there were the Volstead Act in place, which is the prohibition. Um, and this in turn led to a huge amount of organised crime. Um, so if you, you couldn't obtain um, alcohol legally, so you had um, an organised crime that developed and flourished in this environment. So this is our starting point then. The first thing that we're looking at here then is we're looking at social factors thing. We're looking at external forces and how that might impact upon crime. So the answer is pretty much already here, isn't it? What do you think they might be saying then? Have a guess. Um, are they trying to say that <coughs> certain areas, like urban areas, for example, are chromogenic? Yes, they're saying that the certain areas, certain um, urban areas, are there's something about that environment, something about that ecology that means that it's criminogenic. There's something about the environment that is different, and we need to understand the character of that difference. What is the character of that difference in this urban area, which is separate and different from, for example, a rural area? Okay. So there's something that is different about the character of this environment, this urban environment. So we've got 1920s America then, we've got the Great Depression, we've got the Volstead Act, we've got huge amounts of crime, huge, incredible amounts of poverty as well and deprivation, but also significantly large amounts of crime. The crime seems to be out of control, there's huge amounts of organised crime, big concerns, about levels of crime. Now, it's not going to be any surprise to you then that what the Chicago schools say comes from this ecological perspective. Right, so a bit more background before we go into this. Why is it called the Chicago School? It's called the Chicago School because a group of sociologists who were uh, working from Chicago University um, started to develop this idea. Okay, so its foundations are to be found in people like Park and Burgess, for example, people like Shaw and McKay. These were sociologists that were working out at the University of Chicago. Has anyone here been to Chicago? No one been to Chicago? No? You've been to Chicago. Um, when, when did you go? Did you go recently? No, I wasn't really young. You were really young, so you don't really remember your experience. Okay, right. Um, right. Chicago, let me give you some, I just want to give you some, fact, um, some figures to start with, okay, as a starting point. In 1860, okay, in 1860, the population of Chicago was 110,000. 110,000, okay, that was in 1860. In 1910, 1910 or 1920? Yeah, 1910, there was circa two million people living in Chicago. I asked you about what Chicago is like, one of the things that you, know, you would notice about Chicago, it's a very dense city, there's a lot of people there, you know, there's, a, it's a big, there's a big population of people. Right, this is pretty much our starting point here then. Okay, we're looking at the relationship between the environment, the ecology, these external factors um, in this urban area that's um, seemingly associated with large amounts of crime. Right, now these sociologists then in Chicago considered that this, these facts, do you remember, because these are sociological positives, they believe that facts are something that we can use and are reliable, these are tools that enable us to make um, analysis. They said that this figure was significant. Okay? We need to understand this population explosion. Perhaps there's a relationship between population explosion and criminality, okay, these external forces. So right, that's the background. Is this making sense so far? Yeah? Okay, so they're looking at spatial distribution of crime and they want to explore this population exposure. They think that this might be triggered because it seems that this population explosion may in some way be linked to an increase in crime rates. 
Okay? So I wanted to explore this. I wanted to explore the character, what might underpin this, if there was a relationship between the two. So what they did is they developed what's called a zonal hypothesis. A zonal hypothesis. Okay, now, uh, during the last week I said bring your colouring uh, pencils, your crowns, and your, right, this is where you need your, some of you are well stocked with your fancy pencil cases, so uh, this is where you can get out with your colour pens and crowns and stuff. We're going to do some drawing now. Okay. Right, they develop what we call the zonal hypothesis. And this is what the zonal hypothesis looks like. Have you got your coloured crowns there? Yeah. yeah you're well stocked, right? There's a handsome looking pencil case. Right. So this is a zonal hypothesis they mapped on top of Chicago. Okay? So they, they start with this um, area here, which they call the zone in transition. Okay? Now we're going to zoom into the zone in transition in a moment. Now, outside of the zone in transition is what they call zone one. Okay? Then there was zone two. Zone 3 and Zone 4 and finally Zone 5. Now these zones are approximately 2 miles apart. Okay? And what they noticed, they took the crime rates from these different areas. And what they discovered was that this area here, the zone in transition, had the highest rates of crime. Okay? But then they noted that steadily but somehow consistently, crime rates decreased the further you moved away from the zone in transition. So they were highest here, and then they got less, 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 until you got right in the suburbs where they were the lowest. So then the pattern. There's a pattern. Now, sociological positivists, they believe that if we can reveal these patterns, we can then make laws. Okay? We can understand. All we need to do is to develop means and methods to understand what, why these patterns occur. Okay, well, I'm going to rub this out because we're going to, what we're going to do now is we're going to zoom in. So we're going to zoom into the zone in transition now. Right, they said that the zone in transition, part of the zone in that the right at the centre of the zone in transition was another zone which they called the central business district. Okay, the central business district. This was obviously where all of the businesses um, were based. Okay, so this is where um, all the office workers were. This is like the obviously the hub, the, the business hub of the centre. Now if we've got this population exposure. And that's a huge explosion in terms of the number of people. You know, in the, in the course of 50 years, to expand that much, that's an immense explosion. So, what happens then? Well, this, the central business district, each year is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, you can see this. Do any of you live um, in Tower Hill? Don't you live in Tower Hill? If you go to... Um, even places like um, Hoxton, for example, you can see this. I was on a field trip last week, actually, a field ball. And you can see this in operation. You can see where the city is literally getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, how it's encroaching or how it's invading, and I use that term deliberately, how it's invading these areas in the way that when weeds, if you don't cull back weeds, those of you that have got gardens, it would invade the other area, the other territory. So we're using the term, the term the terms that the ecologists would use. So this area then, the central business district, is expanding as the city gets bigger, as, as the city gets bigger, in order to cater for the fact that you, um, there is more and more um, business, there's more and more trade. So this is invading these areas now. That means then that there's a fight for space. Okay. And I so say you can see this in the East End um, where you've got the tower blocks going up where there used to be kind of wasteland. There's like a, there's a period 
that if you like is a zone in transition, a period or an area which is just not quite, it's, it's not one thing nor the other. It's not business, and it's not residential, it's kind of waiting, it's waiting to be developed. It's, it's, it's ripe for development. It's kind of like a vacuum in some ways. Right, so what happens then? Right, so this is zooming in on Chicago. And they said that what happens is, is that Chicago, this, zone, this is the zone in transition. Look, the zone in transition. Okay, so we're zooming in. And they said that the zone in transition has these distinct <coughs> neighbourhoods, different sizes, but distinct nevertheless. Okay? So, for example, they said that there will be a Jewish community, there will be an Irish community, there will be a Chinese community, there will be um, an Italian uh, community. Basically, all the communities from around the world were in some way represented in this zone in transition. So you get these, this, you get the development of distinctive neighbourhoods, okay? Um, and you can see this in other cities in America as well. Those of you that have been to New York, Manhattan, you know, you've got like an Italian quarter, you know, you've got these very distinct neighbourhoods. Um, and you do see it in London as well, to a less extreme effect. Um, so, you know, places like Golden Green, for example, is a notorious Jewish area. Stanford is also another big Jewish area. Um, so you tend to find that there are areas that are characterised by certain nationalities. Where I used to live in Walthamstow, historically that used to be an area that was a, had a higher population of um, Irish people, Irish immigrants. And now there's a bigger, there's a growing Bengali community in, um, in, um, in Walthamstow. And that's now being kind of superseded and replaced by a bigger Polish community. So there's a cycle, there's a kind of, there's an organic nature to this. Things just don't stand still. So, you get these communities developing in the zone of transition, and they noticed that this, there, this, this area here then was a criminogenic zone. This is an area in terms of the space distribution of crime which was characterised by criminality. Okay, so what did they say then? Well, they said that there was something about the character of this area that led to higher rates of crime. Okay? What do you think they might have said there? What explanations do you think they gave for that? Why this area was a high hotspot for crime and then it got less and less and less and further moved away? What explanations might there be for this then? Um, the community is further away more stable and in the zone of transition, people used to be like moving in and out all the time, and so there was a disconnection in society. and Disconnection, I like that word, yeah. So Okay, so, so you, you, I mean, you're absolutely right, well done. You're basically saying that there's something, this, to, to understand the character of this environment, to understand the spatial distribution of crime, we need to understand the movement of people. We need to ask ourselves, what is it about the character of these communities? It's the character of the community which is important, isn't it, here? So, you're right, this is exactly what they said, so we're going to put in some of our zones on the outside just so we've got a so there's zone one so on and so forth so the further you move out then the less crime um, there seems to be in these areas it seems to be Jews and this is what they said they said that one of the reasons why this area had high crime rates was because of the character of the area and they said that this was the kind of your typical inner city slum Okay. So here you've got really cheap housing, you've got lots of poverty. People are naturally attracted to this area because when you come to this, this city for work, um, you obviously want to be near to where the work is, but you also need to find houses, and these are your, your cheap houses here. The further you get away from the city, these, these houses tend to be uh, more expensive. So, they said that we need to understand migration. They said that migration takes um, a range of different forms. They said that you've got people moving from rural areas and from overseas. Okay? And 
when they're moving from rural areas or overseas, they're obviously looking for work. Okay? They're looking to establish themselves in this new environment. So what do you do then? If you go abroad, um, you want, you're going to naturally be attracted to your own community. So if you're coming from Italy, for example, um, it may well be that you've got family that already live here. It may well be that these people, well, obviously these people can speak your language, literally. So they might be able to extend your patronage. They might be able to sort you out with a bit of work here and there. They might know somebody that knows somebody that can find you um, a cheap room somewhere. So you're naturally going to be attracted to um, your own community uh, because they speak your, literally the same language, you, you get your own food, stuffs, all this kind of thing. So you feel a bit more settled within your own community. So, people from rural and overseas areas are going to be attracted to this built in dis distinct neighbourhood. Now, what Shaw and McKay found is that there were three elements that could be found or three elements that characterise the zoning transition. Firstly, they said that these areas were characterised by poverty. Okay, that's the first thing. Now, it's not poverty itself that's the problem here. The problem comes from being poor. So, for example, because these people are poor that live in this area, they don't have the resources in order to deal with the problems of that area. Okay, so they don't have the resources to deal with the problems that come with poverty. Okay? The second thing that they find is that the mobility of residents is really important. Because this is what they say happens. When people move in from the rural areas, okay, they're, they're moving into a vacuum, essentially. Okay. Obviously, you need to find somewhere to live, so there you go, there you go, living there. Okay. Now, obviously, <coughs> that, that place needs to become vacated. Okay. And what happens is, is as Shaw and McKay found, that as people became more established over generations, what they would do is they would move out of the zoning transition into the zoning one, or, or the zoning one, the, 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 um, the, the first zone, zone one. And then after that, they would move out to zone three, to zone four, so on and so forth. Okay? And this takes kind of generations to do. So what happens then is that this area here, this zoning transition, is in a continual, constant state of flux. Okay? So it's almost kind of like a vacuum. You can't get the establishment of settled, stable communities because of the mobility of residents. That means then that no sense of community can really develop because constantly you've got a shifting population, people moving in, people moving out. People don't know their neighbours. People literally don't know who's going to be living next door to them from one day to the <coughs> next because there's this constant turnover of people due to this, these external forces such as migration, okay? People moving in, people moving out. The third factor, in addition to poverty and mobility of residents, was what they noted was uh, what they called racial heterogeneity. So there was a whole hodgepodge of different racial ethnic groups here, which again made the establishment of a settled community very, very difficult because there were no common values. Which meant then that in this environment where there was poverty, high mobility of residents, racial heterogeneity, this led, this kind of toxic mix, these three things together, led to one thing, which is crime. Right. So why then? Why does this toxic mix of racial heterogeneity um, mobility, um, mobility of residents, and also poverty. Why does this lead to high rates of crime then? Well, think about it. If you're living in an environment where you've got constant shifting populations, you don't know who your neighbours are, you've got people moving in, moving out, moving in, moving out. You know, if you're renting, if you're rented accommodation, you don't necessarily feel as though you've got a, a vested interest in the area. Um, so it may well be that you don't show any interest in that area. Um, think about it, when you're walking down the street, if 
if you've got um, your McDonald's packet, there's your, there's your McDonald's, I've shown you McDonald's in your bag there. There you go, smelly McDonald's in the bag. Okay, now once you've eaten that, once you've consumed that, if you're walking along Brixton High Road and there's loads of chicken boxes and loads of rubbish all over the floor, once you've eaten that, what are you going to do? You're going to throw it over your shoulder, aren't you? Because, you know, that area, it doesn't seem as though anyone really cares in that area. There's loads of rubbish, so you know, nobody's going to notice another McDonald's bag, are they? So it's right on the floor. Now, if you're walking along High Street Kensington, these nice, kind of pristine, clean streets that almost seem as though they've been kind of disinfected, and you've got your McDonald's bag, what are you going to do with it once you've eaten it? Find a bin. You're going to find a bin, aren't you? So, you know, we are, we are driven, we are affected by the environment in which we find ourselves then. Okay? So this is what we're looking at. We're looking at how the environment can affect behaviour. And they're saying then that what happens is, is that these areas... The, the, this constant flux, this constant population flux, creates a situation whereby a stable, settled community cannot establish itself. So, these areas, and it's not poverty itself that creates this, okay, that, that creates high crime. It's because these communities are unstable then. Right, so what, what, how does this work in practice then? Well, if the, if the communities are always shifting, if they're always shifting, they're always changing, then what happens, what flows from this is an absence of this informal <coughs> social control. Informal social control mechanisms begin to break down. So what is an informal social control mechanism? Well, an informal social control mechanism would be things like, um, you've got some kids that are kind of... Um, they're, 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 they're playing on the street corner and they're being a bit boisterous and they're throwing stones, okay? Well, you know, what can you do? Well, one thing you could do is, as a, as a concerned neighbour, you could go out there and say, that kids, that, you know, one of you is going to get hurt in a minute, stop throwing stones, okay? Now, that's a form of informal social control as opposed to what? What's a formal social control mechanism? The police. The police are a formal control mechanism, aren't they? So in these environments here, in these communities, and we're using the term community very, very loosely here because it's precisely what they're saying. They're saying these aren't really communities. They are a loose collective of disengaged groups or disengaged individuals. So in these environments then, where there's an absence of social control, an informal social control, crime can flourish. I often use this example. If I give... Holly, a big bag of crack cocaine, and I say to her, right, um, I want you to go and sell this, and I'm going to give you two options of places, environments, that you could sell it. You can sell it in High Street Kensington, or you can sell it in, um, let's say, um, Soho. Okay? Now, which area is she going to go to? Well, I suggest you that she'll probably go to Soho. Now, the reason she might do this is not because there might be a greater market for it in Soho, though that may well be the case, but if you imagine, um, Holly's going to be standing outside High Street Kensington's tube station, looking a bit shifty, with a big bag of crack cocaine here, um, and she's going to be really conspicuous, isn't she? People are going to think, well, that, that, that woman's been standing there for a good couple of hours now, and looking a bit kind of um, strange and conspicuous. Where, you know, when you go to places like Soho, where there is a constant flux, and a constant movement and change of different people coming in after that, Nobody's really going to notice um, Holly standing there saying, does anyone want any crack cocaine? So when there's a breakdown of informal social control mechanisms, crime and criminality can flourish in that environment because nobody knows who each other is. There's no real control, there's no real um, mechanism. Nobody has a vested interest in it. So it kind of anything goes. Is this making sense? Right, so this then flows on. Uh, from what you've looked at before. And this really is the, the foundations for another way of understanding the spatial distribution of crime, which is the broken window type hypothesis. Okay, it's slightly different, but it draws from some of these concepts. Now, just for those that don't remember the broken window type hypothesis, I'll give you a quick outline here, it's pretty simple. So what we have is a row of houses, these are houses obviously, uh, windows, these are doors obviously. Let's do a room. Um, so you've got a row of houses, terrace houses, right? Let's do some windows downstairs as well. I need to go to art lessons, though, my drawing classes, because by my own admission, these are really poor houses. See some chimneys, some smoke. 
Right, okay. So the broken windows hypothesis is, is pretty much this, okay? Fairly straightforward. Right, if you've got a broken window, there's broken windows. If you do not fix broken windows, this is put forward by people like Kenning and Coles, for example, yeah? What happens is, is that these are what are known as signal crimes. Signal crimes. Okay. So if there's graffiti on this wall here, um, if there's all broken bottles outside this house, there's rubbish, big pile of rubbish outside this house. They are signal crimes. <coughs> and signal crimes send out a very strong message. A very strong message that no one cares. In some ways it sends out a message that kind of crime is welcome here. So unless you fix this broken window, these other windows will get broken. Because what happens is, is that criminality attracts other forms of criminality. Okay, this is what they say, this is what they argue. They argue that unless you fix this broken window, what happens is that this instigates a cycle of decline. So, what's the dynamics here? Well, this is where we link back in some ways to the Chicago school. The people that live in this house, they've got quite a good job, okay? Or they've got a job. Now that means then that they can, they can spot the signs of decay. They can spot the signs that this, this area is deteriorating. So they have the resources, okay? Do you remember we said earlier on about the importance of poverty? It's not about poverty itself, it's about having the resources. They have the resources to move out into nice leafy parts of the country like I did. Okay, so you can move from Walthamstow to a nice suburban kind of area that's nice and leafy and green, okay, because you have the resources to do that. Now, what does that mean? And that leaves a vacuum, doesn't it? Okay, so people that do not have a house are then basically, here we go, here's people that don't have a house. Um, there's a, two little kids, but no arms. Well, they move into that house then. Okay, so you've got a constant mix, a constant flux, okay? So you need to fix these broken windows. So this neighbourhood then enters into a spiral of decline. Okay, it starts to deteriorate even further until and unless you begin to fix those broken windows. Now, another idea that flows from the Chicago School, in, in some ways has its roots in uh, the Chicago School, is what's called situational crime prevention. Situational <coughs> crime prevention. Now, I'm going to explain this to you uh, by way of another uh, drawing. Um, so what we have is, this is a railway track, and these are blocks of houses. Okay, you kind of, this is kind of your typical inner city sink estate, if you like. Okay, so you've got kind of little narrow corridors, linking in big blocks and flats. And here you've got, there's a car park there. Okay. Um, you've got an access road into the estate here, and then another access road into the estate here. Right now, um, there's also here um, a disbanded or uh, disused community centre. Right now, this is um, you, you kind of typical inner city sink estate. We're all familiar with this. We, we know, you know, we're, some of us live on, on these places. You know, we, we, we know some of us bought up in places like this. We know what, what, what they consist of. Now, there are problems. So what are the problems? Oh, well, I've got the, here we've got um, a wooded area here. Okay, and also um, here, there's like a small garden that's all overgrown, there's all like big bushes there. Okay, right, so what are the problems there? Well, I'll tell you what the problems are. Here, the railway track. The railway track is constantly being bombarded with um, kids throwing stones and kids playing on the railway track. Primarily because the fence here is not suitable, it's, it's, too, it's too low. Here, so you've got two access points onto the estate. Cars are being stolen at an alarming rate. Okay, so here, cars are not only just being stolen, but they're being broken into, being vandalized, being damaged. Here, up here, you've got loads of kids smoking crack in the woods. Okay, um, here, um, in parts of the estate, you've got prostitutes that are working as well. Okay, you've got drug dealers. You've got kids basically riding BMX um, bikes, um, robbing people, and escaping on these little rap, um, rap lines. Um, because obviously you know, they know all the routes around the, the, the estate. Um, and you've got this community centre here. Okay, so what sort of things could you do there? Right? What we're doing now is we're going to adapt the environment um, in order to try to design out criminality. So situational crime prevention. 
Now, there's lots of technologies that we can use, so very basic practical things we can do in order to adapt this environment um, to, try to, to try to design out crime. Now, these sort of things have been tried in various places. Um, similar things that um, have been employed in places like um, uh, Bloomsbury Square, Russell Square. Are you familiar with these areas? Um, Russell Square historically had a, uh, had a reputation uh, for what's called, well, I guess cottages, I suppose, basically men meeting up, gay men meeting each other and having sex in the bushes, um, or drug dealers um, dealing drugs. Um, this is particularly the case in Bloomsbury Square. Now, what they did is they adapted the environment to try to design this out. And now, um, a few years ago, so 10 years ago, you used to have these massive great big bushes where you could literally go in there if you wanted to have sex, you could do, um, if you wanted to deal with drugs, you could because nobody could see in there. So what they did is they cut back all the bushes and made it low level so there was a natural surveillance through the area. Um, so you could actually, you've got this natural surveillance that, that would obviously um, uh, deter people from committing these acts. So what can we do here? Well, let's change the environment. Well, let's put in a higher fence, okay, to start with. We can put in gates here to regulate the traffic in and out. Okay, so if cars get stolen, um, they can't just drive out. Okay, they need to go through these gates. And these are, these are, this then becomes what's called defensible space. It becomes you're turning pri public space into private space. These rat runs, get rid of all of these rat runs. Okay, so, to, to kind of, so that way you can kind of regulate the movement um, a little bit more effectively. Here, you cut back all of these trees. Okay, so you've got natural, some kind of natural surveillance. Here, you put in big cameras, not only big cameras, but you start lighting up the area, big lights everywhere, okay? Here at the flats, you, you set up like a concierge system as well, um, so you get man entrance um, into these areas. Let me show you, this is an idea that was developed by somebody called Coleman, Alex Coleman, and she talks about defensible space. Um, some of you might live in places like this. Um, in Scotland, they call them tenements. In this country, they've been called more like to call them maisonettes. So these are doors. Um, so we're looking directly on. Okay, so there's a roof there, sort of thing. Uh, you familiar with the sort of thing I'll talk about here? Yeah. Okay. What you have here is you have like a, a joint landing, like stairwell that um, you can access even here. Now, these areas then. Um, Tend to, tend to attract particular forms of criminality. So this stairwell, for example, um, it will invariably stick to piss um, where people have uh, just had a pee in there, or if, it's, if, it, if there's um, um, uh, lifts there, you know, they're broken, vandalised. So there's all graffiti, there's all rubbish in there, people have left all crap in there, left their bottles, boxes in there, and all that kind of stuff. Um, now, you can adapt this environment, you can change this environment in a way to try to design out crime. And what Colvin noted is that people like to have space that they can defend, defendable space. So, you can create defensible space. So what you do is you put land, you put doors in each landing. So that only people that live, only these one, two, three, four, only these five houses have access to this landing. Okay, and what happens is, is um, and this is what you notice, you get these kind of people start putting out hanging baskets outside their house. You know, they start putting their kids' bikes outside the house. And they start kind of taking an interest in this environment directly outside their house. So it be, they begin to make it look nice. Okay? If it looks nice, people begin to feel as though it, it, it feels safe as well. Okay? Because often what happens is that form follows fear. Okay? So what I mean by that then is that when people are fearful, if they think that there's, there's a, the likelihood that they're going to be robbed or they're going to be broken into, they start putting big gates out, outside their door, okay, big, big kind of mesh gates. And what that does is it sends out a very strong signal that people are scared, and you get these kind of fortress communities. Um, and you know, we saw this when we went on a field trip last week, these areas um, that are, you know, there's gates everywhere, there's grills everywhere, and it is, it's form follows fear. Okay? It kind of, the, the environment reflects people's concerns. 
Now, there are a whole range of different problems with this as an approach, which we'll explore in greater detail in, um, in the seminars uh, next week. Uh, but that's pretty much an outline of the Chicago School. Then. They're looking at the spatial distribution of crime. They're looking at how um, the environment impacts upon individual group behavior. Um, and again, you know, this is an explanation that, that um, has its um, foundations outside, outside of the individual. So you're not looking here at individual explanations. You're not looking at why Joe Bloggs has been um, committing armed robbery. You're looking at how the environment, how these external factors can impact upon group behaviour. Okay? So you know, the, the absence of a stable set of community means that crime can flourish in that environment. So you need to create things like um, maybe like a right to buy, for example. So you try to um, devise mechanisms to create and establish a more stable community. If you have a more stable community, then the idea is, is that crime rates will decline, they will reduce as a consequence of that. Okay, does anyone have any questions on this? Does this make some sense to you? Pretty straightforward. So that there are a range of problems with this approach. Janet Foster, for example, um, she applied this study to, um, to England and she said that um, it was the a a absolute opposite in fact. She found that the, um, these council estates, these, these, um, what we would now call the zoning transition, actually have very strong communities. The total of absence to what Shaw and McKay and Burgess found, they said, she said that they were very clearly um, very good, strong communities, so that can't be the explanation at all. So we shouldn't accept this um, uncritically. There are problems with it, we'll explore those more in the seminar. Okay, thank you.